Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Miami Book Fair and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Jill McCorkle to discuss her new novel, Hieroglyphics, published by our friends at Algonquin. In her deeply layered and masterful new novel, Jill McCorkle deconstructs and reconstructs what it means to be a father or a mother and what it means to be a child piecing together the world around us and learning to make sense of the hieroglyphics of history and memory. Jill McCorkle's first two novels were released simultaneously when she was just out of college and the New York Times called her a born novelist. Since then, she has published six novels and four collections of short stories and her work has appeared in Best American Short Stories several times. Five of her books have been New York Times notable books, and her most recent novel, Life After Life, was a New York Times bestseller. She has received the New England Booksellers Award, the John Dos Passos Prize for Excellence in Literature, and the North Carolina Award for Literature. She was a Briggs Copeland Lecturer in Fiction at Harvard, where she also chaired the Department of Creative Writing. Jill is currently a faculty member of the Bennington College Writing Seminars and is affiliated with the MFA program at North Carolina State University. In conversation with Jill this evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my boss, Mitchell Kaplan. Mitchell founded the independent bookstore Books and Books in 1982. In 2015, Books and Books was named Publishers Weekly Bookstore of the Year. Mitchell is the co-founder of Miami Book Fair, a former president of the American Booksellers Association, and received the National Book Foundation's prestigious Literarian Award for Outstanding Service to the American Literary Community in 2011. He's the host of the podcast, The Literary Life with Mitchell Kaplan, and with his partner, Paula Mazur, formed the Mazur Kaplan Film Production Company to bring books to the screen. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after the talk. You can find hieroglyphics and any other book you might need for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep Books and Books up and running, so we thank you. And now, without further ado, I'd like to bring our guests to the stage. Hello. Hi. Hi, Jill. Hi. Welcome. Great. You know, this is be here. <laughs> I know it's you're in North Carolina, right? Yes. And you know, normally when we do this, and I think we've been doing this almost for forty years now, you usually come and physically do this in Miami. I know. And I, I can't thank you enough for doing this tonight with us as well. Well, my pleasure. I I. I would have loved to have been there in person, for sure. Well, you know, uh, uh, my my um, my relationship, as I said, goes back 40 years. I can remember almost like it was yesterday when you and I met one another. I think it was at a booksellers convention, a Southern booksellers convention. And you had just published July 4th and The Cheerleader, which they brought out at the very same time, which is very unusual at that time. Also, the other thing that was unusual, they were printed in these very cool, small editions. Right. And if any of you out there are book collectors or are interested in the design of books, I urge you to find those hardcover books. They are just gorgeous. And you were there under the auspices of Louis Rubin, if I remember, who had started mm -hmm. Algonquin Press. Yes. In fact, we didn't even have a booth in the main hall. He set up a, a card table outside of the main the main event and basically told me to stand beside it, you know, and point to my book. So um, it, was in the, it was in the lobby, I remember. In fact. <laughs> yes. So tell me the importance of Louis Rubin to you and Algonquin, what that has meant to you as a writer. And over all these years, you've stayed with Algonquin as a publisher. I have I have stayed. Um, boy, Lewis r really changed my life. He, he, he was my teacher in college and just continued to read um, 
what I was writing after I had graduated. And, and he was the one, you know, when I had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated, if I graduated, you know, and he's the one who said, well, you're going to go to a writing program. And I'm like, yeah. So anyway, he, he pointed the way and then he, you know, had the brainstorm for this small house, Algonquin. And, and it literally, I was on the second list. So um, it, the, when I met you, the office was in a shed in his backyard in Chapel Hill. Well, if you think about it too, in those days, Southern voices were not heard very, right. very loudly. They weren't well published and that sort of thing. And you're right, you know, there's no reason to put a label on anyone's work, but there were these incredible writers living in the South at the time who were just underpublished for one reason or another. Who That's, were some of the influences that you had at the time? Well, Lee Smith was also a teacher of mine um, and Max Steele. And um, so I, I was very lucky with them. And then, of course, I met Josephine Humphreys uh, very early and Richard Bausch and um, Lewis Norton. I mean, it it's a pretty small world, you know, once you start meeting the various it writers. One, it was wonderful to see yeah. that world develop. And as a bookseller, to all of a sudden hear these voices you know, that you hadn't heard from before. And even though Miami's in the South, it's yeah. really not the South. So right. we were really able to experience these various things. And now you see a lot of younger writers who are now standing on your shoulders and standing on Lee Smith's shoulders and mm -hmm. everybody else's shoulders. And it must be very gratifying for you. It it really is. It is. I've, I've, I've talked for a long time now. In fact, a wonderful writer is in the audience, Lydia Martin, who was um, who I worked with at Bennington. And Lydia is a Miami writer. So it's yeah. really great that yes. yeah, Lydia is remarkable. And it's so are we so happy that she had the experience to to uh, to take your class. Your new book is Hydra uh, Hieroglyphics. <laughs> Hieroglyphics. Uh, my mouth is not working so well today. It's a marvelous. It's a marvelous story. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about it. It's really a story told through so many different voices, and it's the voices that carry you along. Um, and the other thing you do in hieroglyphics, which for me was so interesting, is not only do you experiment with different voices, but you experiment with each voice expressing themselves in a different kind of writing, in a different form of writing. Uh, you have letters, you have little bits, you have, you know, first person, then you don't have first person. Can you talk to me a little bit about hieroglyphics, what it's really about, and what caused you to 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 write it in the form that you did? Yes, um, it was a novel in a thousand pieces for a long time because I, I knew I wanted to write a book about... Um, memory and and I also had had been very interested in these two real life events that had happened um, a train wreck in my native county in North Carolina in 1943 uh, which I heard about growing up uh, it was one of those before and after moments that changed so many lives and then I lived for 20 years in the Boston area. And as soon as I got there, I realized people referred to the Coconut Grove fire in a very similar way. It had touched so many lives in the area. And so originally I was I was curious about exploring, um, you know, the time period of those events in the early 40s. And it, I just couldn't get it to fly. And and yet I had um the character Lil's voice kind of in my mind. And, and so ultimately it, it became about the children of people who were lost in these events. So, so it's the next generation. And so my idea for Lil and Frank grew out of that. Um, they're in the, in the novel, an elderly couple who have retired 
from New England to North Carolina. Um, but they both were shaped as children by these early losses of a parent in um, these events that that 700 miles apart, but took place um, about a year apart and overlapped geographically in significant ways because a lot of the people on the train were heading to the Boston area in New England. Well, and <clears throat> for those who haven't read it, that's just a very broad little sort of clip about what the novel is really about because the thing about this novel which struck me is just how rich it is and and how it takes you through the course of these various lives and it the, the reason why i read fiction often is to have that cathartic experience of um kind of living other people's lives and learning sort of who they are because the one thing that you write about a lot in this is you write about what's hidden, what we, you know, the, the, there's a sense of longing to, so, and you, you're sort of revealing what is hidden in these people's lives, that if you see them on the surface, it's one thing. But once you get deeper into them, you understand that we all hide things in one way or another. Right. And, and, and there's so much about our parents will never know. Um, ways that our children will never see us. Um, so, you know, I was, I was thinking about that a lot and, and just about, um, well, all the things that surround us that have meaning in our lives or, or the way that we have this kind of shorthand language with people we're really close to where, you know, one word, um, can stand for a whole episode or story and everybody laughs and you don't even have to tell the story anymore. And yet if, if the story's not told or there's not a keeper of these, um, so, so much disappears. Um, well, it was so interesting to me is that you, that, you know, Lil was one of my favorite characters, I think in this book, the relationship between Lil and Frank is, is so profound. And the way Lil, the way you tell Lil stories is Lil is kind of the hoarder of memory in a sense. And she's <laughs> trying to, she's trying to explain to her children, leaving them notes and writing them little, you know, little, uh, little essays about mem about things that happened in their lives that they will then discover later on about mm -hmm. the two of them. Uh, talk about why you chose that. Where did, where did that come from? Um, I wanted, I, I chose first person because I, I do think that letters, uh, words on a page have the power to sort of reconjure a, a time or a memory. And so, um, for her to be going through or, or writing in the present tense, um, I felt I felt like I was able to capture her voice at different stages of, of life, which I, which I think was the most challenging part of her, you know, to, to sort of have this young frazzled mother over here and then someone looking back on it all. Yeah. Someone who's much older looking back. And we, we know we kind of get a sense of the, the time frame and the movement because you date the different, um, you know, the different entries. So we have a sense of the time, but the way time moves, you know, we don't think of time literally uh, in a linear way all the time. We're thinking of it through memory more than anything else. And, and you, you, you bring up a phrase in the book that I remember called time sick, sort of like time sickness in some way. Would you explain what that is? Yeah. In fact, that's, that's in part of uh, what I had put aside to, to read, um, you know, just the way you feel homesick, and um, and for me, I think a lot of times it's it's time sick. It's um, you know, I, I was surprised after I had lived in Boston for twenty years. I I had sort of always thought I would eventually be back in North Carolina, um, and I was so surprised at how homesick I felt for that place, and so much of it is. Um, but, you know, I loved it and love so much about it. 
but the home of my children, you know, so suddenly this place also houses all the memories of sort of every stage of their growing up. And, um, and so for me, that is, that's the kind of time, time sick, you know, that, that even, even through difficult times, we, we sometimes think about and, and it's like, what happened to that sweater? You know, I love that sweater. <laughs> or, or, you know, you remember what book you were reading. Um, we, we remember all kinds of little parts of life. Um, and that's that, those are the little parts I think that make it unique, rich. No, and I, I think part of the success of this book is that you are able to capture, at least for me, kind of the way people experience the world. I mean, you don't experience the world in this very well orderly way. And and the book in the book, you have snippets and people are kind of all over the place. But there is an overarching storyline. And the storyline is that Lil and Frank are leaving New England to come down. They're they're migrating back to North Carolina to be near one of their children, right? Mm -hmm. And when they're there, it's where Frank lived. And Frank, you have this charming opening scene where Frank Frank is going to visit the house that he grew up in, right? In order to sort of, which trigger is the triggering mechanism for all these other memories as well. Right. Yeah, his, he, he, he was forced into this place in the aftermath of the train wreck. So um, right. and that, that brings the other two characters, the single mother, Shelly, and her six-year-old son, Harvey. Um, they're both kind of struggling. And so for the longest time, I had no idea. I kept thinking, am I writing two different novels? <laughs> because what do they have in common? Um but then as soon as I realized, you know, that that Harvey is basically growing, growing up right on top of where Frank grew up, you know, so they're occupying the same geography and that sort of worked. Well, and I don't know. I mean, you must have channeled maybe children you knew, but the the, the veracity with which you experience and I have two boys who are twins mm -hmm. and you nailed Harvey so well. I mean, you Thank really you. got this young boy, I mean, with his kind of weird preoccupations and all of that sort of thing. So how hard was it to do a young boy like Harvey? Well, I I also have a, a son, uh, now all grown up. But, um, you know, I did take notes when my children were growing up. So, so afraid that I would forget. And I'm sure many things got away. Um, but, but also, you know, I, I think that um, I have often uh, thought that the world can kind of be split between those who outgrew a certain kind of um, elementary school humor and those who did <laughs> not. And I clearly did not. Um, no, you didn't. So, so I was, mean, some of the things you have, some of the things you have in there, you have to read this book just to, you know, the kind of collections that Harvey has. I won't go into what they are, yeah, but yeah. they're kind of unusual. Yeah. Well, no, I, you know, my, I, th there's some little things, you know, that I've never forgot. Um, that that found their way in there. I mean, my son once, for some reason, coated a whole lamp in Vaseline, you know, and I had no idea why. And the whole time, you know, sort of rubbing his hands through his hair. So he looked like those little ducklings after the Valdez spill for about for about three months. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, yeah, boys will be boys, right? Yeah. But 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 that that is that is the beauty of this this novel. I mean, it rings so true on so many levels. You know, to read a novel, particularly for me, I finished it a few days ago, and to read it, you know, during this kind of pandemic and being kind of locked down and kind of the richness of people's lives, which we kind of forget a little bit about. I mean, there's so much death around us and so much insecurity around us that the whole notion of memory and that, you know, that, that we are 
having to remember the whole, you know, you look at the news and they start talking about people who've died and who they are and, you know, lives well lived or lives simply lived. We forget the kind of graininess of our existences. And, and just being in that novel enveloped me in a way that brought me closer to a kind of humanity. I, I, I know I'm going on and on. I'm probably waxing too long. But I just want you to know the effect that it had on me was, was very, very profound during this period. Thank you. I, I think that what first attracted me to those, um, the, the train wreck and the coconut grove um, was in both cases reading about those events. It came down to these cataloged lists of little ways that humans were identified to their loved ones. And sometimes, you know, it, it was as simple as, um, well, not as simple, it was complicated, but, you know, a dry cleaning tag or a particular brand of shirt or a cuff link or, you know, some kind of token in a pocket. And um, and it was just that, you know, these these little, the, the kind of thing you get up and you put on the shirt and you button it and, and you don't think about all these little objects um in the daily daily life and and then you get in a situation like this and you and and you appreciate so many things i mean i was thinking the other day what i wouldn't give to be like you know really irritated by a big crowd of people waiting to see a really great movie <laughs> yes. Isn't it, or being even being on a subway somewhere being jostled oh, around yeah. Yeah. yeah, a subway sounds pretty great. Or, or you know, you watch a movie and you see all these crowded city streets, and and you just and it 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 kind of. I was watching something recently, and it hit me the same way it always does when I see the twin towers, you know, in the backdrop of a movie. Um, yeah. The the other thing that this did because of uh, because of the relationship of Frank and Lil and. And the fact that they are older in this, and they're basically retired, and 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 they're facing the end of their lives, really, uh, and they're and they're thinking backward, um, you know, getting older myself, and you know, sitting and thinking and understanding that there is a kind of door at the end of the, you know, there's a wall at the end of the road, and it sort of spurs memory in all of us, and then you start thinking. And there's a kind of haunting that happens. You become haunted by memory in one way or another. And there's a huge amount of haunting in your novel. Will you talk a little bit about that too? Um, yeah, because I think, you know, Lil has a line, you know, we're all haunted by something. It's something we did or did not do. I mean, I think sometimes in life we're, we're just as haunted by that letter you meant to write and now the person's not there. Um, uh, the, you know, wishing you had stood up for somebody or said the right thing, you know. Um, and, and, and so early on, I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I am interested in all these things that did not get said, did not get done. Um, which which certainly doesn't sound like the plot of a novel. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I was it, a little, wor a is, little worried it. about a, a little worried about that. But um, but I think that we are haunted in such a way that that those times in life when we've missed the mark or not done something we wish we had done, we play it over and over. And you know, it's like I always tell my students. You know, sometimes something doesn't have to actually happen on the page. Sometimes it's enough for a character to have imagined, you know, sometimes it's even more powerful to know what they wish they had done and did not. So. And, and you also flirt with, you also flirt with the ghostly elements of it. You know, I could tell that you obviously enjoy ghost stories or you must enjoy ghost stories. I do. There's something ghostly about, some of the incidents in the book. Um, Definitely. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, um, maybe the the woo woo factor. I mean, um, right. Harvey Harvey is really thinking, you know, and and he's just 
um, completely obsessed with ghosts and, and real ghost stories. But I think with Lil, it's more um, those kinds of um, kind of the spiritual connection she she feels with this mother who's been gone all these years and things that remind her um and and it grows out of language you know i have lil and frank have this secret word that they've decided you know based on the houdinis it's like whoever goes first is supposed to come back you know right, um, right. and and i actually got that idea um from you know, I, I think I was in high school and my dad worked at the, the post office and he came home one night and he was just clearly moved. And um, it's because this person he had never seen, uh, you know, in this small town comes up to the window and and looked at my dad and said, is everything copacetic? And my dad said he had never heard anyone use that word except his dad. Oh, wow. And and yeah, um, and the man just you know bought his stamps, turned around and left. He never saw him again. And he, you know, it just um, one of those those little crisscross places in life where you know you suddenly feel you've glimpsed someone or connected. Well, you know, those of us those out there watching who are from South Florida know that we have our own mythologies here dealing with ghosts there are you know i was i was looking the other day in our in our um in our floridiana section and there's book after book about different haunted you know haunted houses that the haunted houses of miami you know that sort of thing and it's it's really interesting how much that is a part of so many people's lives that idea of you know, of under uh, thinking that there's something beyond and trying to get in touch with that in some way. And, yeah. and Harvey's fascinations are really interesting along those lines. Yes. As, as I mean, I think I've got those books. Uh, next time I'm there, I'll have to get one. Oh, really? I'll send you some. I, I love to buy those local, you know, because they are so steeped in um, a specific place. So. Yeah, they are indeed. But, um, would you mind reading a little something? No, uh, I will read a little of, of Lil, and I'll I'll start. Oh, good. Where we I, I love from. Lil, and this is the book, and Joe will be reading a little bit from it. We all are haunted by something, something we did or didn't do, and the passing years either add to the weight or diminish it. Mine have diminished, perhaps because I've spent time thinking about it all. It might sound silly, but I see these bits and pieces as my contribution to evolution, the unearthing and dusting of the prints and markers that led me here. Some seem to bulldoze right through life and up to their headstones, but I want to take my time. I want to find the right words. I imagine my recipient to be you two or perhaps your children, and I hope this is so rather than some stranger who comes in and hoists old boxes into a dumpster or rakes away the remainders of my life like the sad debris in the aftermath of a flood or fire. I'll never get over the sight of what we left behind at our home of over 50 years to move down here, a mountain of cast off things, old towels and linens, papers and books and shoes and pots, side tables and lamps, hoses and hose, packets of seeds I meant to plant, and a rubber squeak toy that had been safely hidden away in the back of my closet by one of the dogs long dead, and so much more, things not needed, things long forgotten, cans of cream of whatever soup and V8 juice, why, and peas that had sat there forgotten for years and things that never should have been there in the first place, like tuna helper or those things in my closet, like that geometric print mini dress I bought in the sixties, hoping to look like Petula Clark or Judy Carn, a perky pixie kind of dress that I never had the nerve to wear and instead looked at it there at the back of the closet for years, along with a wiglet and a long frosted fall 
and some jackets with shoulders resembling a football player or Victorian monarch. We divided it all into goodwill, consignment, recycle, landfill, but there were also the things I couldn't let go of, letters, reminders, souvenirs, and I'm taking my time, relieved when I find something that might have gotten lost in that mountain of debris, like one of your drawings from first grade or the stub from a movie I'd forgotten I even saw or a note from my father. When the moving van pulled away that afternoon and we got in the car and turned southward, the space within seemed so empty, vacant. Our suitcases and silver chest in the trunk, an overnight bag and thermos of coffee on the back seat. And I had that terrible feeling that I had forgotten something because I was thinking of all the times the car was filled with you two, your belongings, your music and voices, the dogs, while going to school or on vacation or just to the grocery store where I bought all those things that I then put on the shelf there in our dimly lit pantry on the red gingham contact paper I spent one snowy afternoon 40 years ago cutting and sticking in place. All those things that I put there and then forgot about. In short, I am homesick and I am time sick. I would be lying not to say that. It's possible to feel content and resolved and still be homesick. I miss all that no longer is, which is why I paste and piece all these scraps together. Sometimes I hold a ticket or photo, a piece of paper, while willing myself back to where I first held it. I know that might sound silly, but it's what I do. I want to hear your young voices, the dog scratching to come in. I want to call my father on the telephone, finger in that rotary dial, one number at a time, TW33642. Let me take this playbill and arrive at the theater or this receipt and find myself there in the produce aisle of Star Market. Then after the show, after I check out, after I sit and let the car warm up, I drive those familiar streets home and find everything just as I left it, the kitchen door creaking behind me. Stop there. Oh, that is beautiful, Jill. Thank you. You know, that is just lovely. I, You know, a gentle rain has just started on my roof here in Miami. It's right here. You, yeah, <laughs> I, I can hear you read all night. Maybe uh, we'll just do away with the audience and you'll just read to me all night. That is really, really beautifully done. Thank you. Thank and you. And I can remember my phone number was Jefferson one one nine six two. That was my number. J E one one nine six two. Yeah, I mean, I have so many of those numbers in my head, but I can't. I mean. You know, now we plug yeah. it into the phone and just. But, yeah, um, I can't even remember numbers anymore. I know I, I can't pushing someone's name, but right. you know, you. I think we need to explain to the audience as well that she is actually writing letters to her own kids in those at that yes. time, right? Yes. Um, and we learn something about her two kids through her letters that she's yes. writing as well, a boy and a girl. Um, in terms of that. The the other the other overarching thing that I, I I came away with is the whole notion that we keep secrets. We just do. People keep secrets. Talk mm -hmm. about the importance of secrets in the book, hieroglyphics. Um I think that yeah, you know, with with Lil and and Frank in their marriage, um there there are secrets that that she's having to come to terms with. Um, I think Lil is the kind of person she's going to grab a flashlight and, and search every closet and shine the light on it, you know, and Frank is very compartmentalized and, and for him, both good memories of his boyhood uh, alongside darker memories. He, he sort of found, he finds both painful, you know, to look back. So he, he has bottled up a lot and stored it. And, and he's taught archaeology courses all these years. So, you know, there's a lot of overlap, um, you know, in that, in that he has he searched all these other time 
periods and interest, but his own life he has shelved. And then um, the young mother, Shelly, has made her her whole past a secret in many ways, even even from herself. You know, she's she's not allowing well, she her doesn't she doesn't allow her son to really know where his father is or what right. went on there. Right. So there's a lot um, that's not told. I mean, Lil's mother basically went out one night, not saying she was going to the coconut grove. She said she was going to teach a dance class and that's all they know, you know? So, so there's a lot about, um, yeah, secrets and, and what gets withheld and how it affects other people. Right. It's what, it's the dig. It's the archeological dig of our lives, right? That's, you know, there's archeology. span He doesn't really, you know, Frank very, sort of doesn't even realize that the hieroglyphics he's looking for is right in front of him in many right. ways. You know, he's, he's the archeologist yet he's overlooking things left and right more or Definitely. less. Definitely. Um, really. I just, uh, you know, I'm going to read a little something to you this and, and it's the way I sort of felt about it. And it's by Rebecca Mackay who writes about hieroglyphics and she says, Jill McCorkle has long been one of our wryest, warmest, wisest storytellers. In hieroglyphics, she takes us through decades, through loss, through redemption, and lands in revelation and grace. As always with Jill McCorkle, the story feels so effortless and true that we might well miss a high wire act she's performing. But make no mistake, she's up there without a net. She never misses a step, and it's spectacular. I couldn't agree with her more. This is a remarkable book, and everybody out there should be punching that green button on their screen to make sure that they get a copy of this book. And in fact, Jill, we will be able to provide signed copies as well. So we hope that if you order it, uh, we'll make sure to send you a signed copy too. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, I believe. So let me let me check the questions and go to them. And one question is, writers are often obsessed by something like a theme that comes up in all or most of their writing. Uh, what is that for you? Is there one thing that is a thread through all of your work, would you say? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think I do write a lot about second chances um, and and the ability to to have a second chance, um, you know, and some some characters do a better job of uh, making use of it than others uh, in the name of reality. But but I think I I do think that's the theme. Um I mean, I, I think it's unfortunate how in so many ways in our society, everything is about winning and, and, you know, mistakes are considered, you know, something that's going to drop you down and you never climb back up. But in fact, those kinds of mistakes and accidents, you know, very often are, are the stuff that really make us into who we are and, and turn us into some, something, you know, a more positive change. And, and so I, I do think I write a lot about people just getting to circle back. And, and I think it's hard to talk about that without, without engaging memory um, and sort of facing what the past offered in order to go forward. Yeah, no, I've often felt the very same thing. I've often felt that, one can't grow unless they take chances. If you if you have a fear of failing, you really can never grow because you can never learn from the mistakes you make. I have, I've, for about 25 years, I've kept this Kierkegaard quote over my desk, life, life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood backward. So, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's so, wonderful. and I, I really think that's a lot of what's going on. Um, even little Harvey, you know, he he's he's trying to figure out where his dad is. So they all are looking back on something. 
Uh, here's somebody who's asking, can you tell us how you settled on the title? Um, yeah, you know, I, I love that word. And I was I was so afraid something would happen. You know, I Googled and it had never been used in fiction. Um, some of you may remember that with my last novel, Life After Life, which I had Googled faithfully for several years, <laughs> thinking, novel, you know, write it. and then, you know, uh, Kate Atkinson's Life After Life, it came out the same week. I and, um, you. you know, uh, which, you know, the, the hope is that many people bought mine by mistake, but, um, so we, we made sure that yours had a higher stack. Than yours. So. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I just, I love the word and I've always been, you know, kind of fascinated by, um, the tombs and, and, you know, the writings and carvings and, and, but I came to think of this novel as being about more than just different languages that we use. You know, Shelley uses shorthand. Um, I, I just started thinking about um, abbreviations we use on notes or, or how someone in the future without help would decipher some of the little notes and scraps and messages that we all leave. And likewise, many of the... Um, the, the souvenirs in life, you know, that, right. that we have for a reason, um, you know, it might look like just a rock, <laughs> but um, right. often there's, there's a story there. Well, and even Harvey, isn't Harvey learning, is it Klingon? Is he learning? He's trying to learn yeah. that a little bit. In yes, fact. Klingon. In fact, on eBay, I got a Klingon uh, decoder ring. I found and um, oh yes, and I got a Captain Midnight bat. I mean, there really is this little. Oh, decoder. that's terrific! Yeah. Well, you know, my my father, who was would be just a little older than uh, than um, Frank, I guess. My my dad remembers that so clearly from the '30s. You know, the '30s mm -hmm. and '40s from the mm -hmm. old radio programs where mm -hmm. they would always send the Dakota ring or they would send something else out. So that was a very big part of people, particularly who were older as well, right. I think. Yeah. Um, somebody, somebody is asking about what I think is a gorgeous cover design. How much, how much input do you have in the cover design and the publication of the book as an object as well? You know, I, I was included a lot this time and that, that felt very good. Um, this this may be my favorite cover. Um, they they, you know, I think I think there was question should there be an image, and I was so happy when I saw just the the broken word, um, and letting the word stand for itself. And I like the color. Oh, the color is gorgeous. Yeah, no, it's beautiful, and and it's just really a, just such a a beautiful object as well, which leads me to another question that somebody had about the role of your editor in this process. How does the editing process work with you? Yeah, um, this is the first book I worked on with Kathy Porries, who, who I think is just wonderful. My whole career had been, you know, with Lewis off to the side, but he pretty early um, on put me in the hands of Shannon Ravenel and Shannon and I worked together for 30 years, <laughs> 30 plus. She recently um, retired, right? Yes. She retired uh, right after life after life came out. And, um, and so the work with Kathy has been wonderful and she's, she's a very similar kind of editor. You know, I always feel like I, I learned so much working on each each book and they're all different. Um, but the kind of editing, you know, where you're asked to um, to make it work, you know, if it's not working, how do you make it work? Or, so or do, you, do, you, do you give her do you give her a draft and then she writes notes and then you yes. you wrangle with the notes and that sort of thing? Yes. 
But I mean, this novel, you, you can imagine, it was in a million pieces. And I think I started with every character except Harvey. You know, for a long time, Frank opened the book. And then I started with Lil. And, and then, you know, it really came down to um, cutting and shaping the different parts. So one didn't overpower the other. And... Um, and coming up with the present timeline, you know, which I basically always had in my mind that that it it sort of was framed around Frank's around Frank. And um, anyway, it, it was just, you know, it. but I love that kind of work because it's like spread it all out on the floor, you know, and and um, and Kathy was just wonderful. Her notes were just extensive and, and insightful. And so it's very sad. Well, when you read the book, when those of you read the book, you'll see how difficult it must have been to figure out where to put each of the voices in terms of creating the narrative. But whatever, however, whatever alchemy you went through, it was very successful. So it worked. It really Thank worked. And I think, I think starting with Sheila was really brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, introducing the way you introduced Frank and Lil was really sort of a brilliant thing. You think they're going to be in sort of maybe not the main characters. Right. And then they are in that sense. Right. Um, that was one scene where all four of them, you know, are appear. together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. right. And um, yeah. And Sheila, I think, I don't, I don't know if you said it this time, but I, I remember reading somewhere that Sheila might've been a short story at one point. Uh, you had thought of her as that. Yes. I'm not mistaken. Um, th there is a kind of voice that I often um, have somewhere in my head. I, I have had this woman's voice in, in a lot of different characters, you know, and um, when I feel like writing a rant, it's good to have that person. And, and she definitely is that person, you know, the person without the filter, um, who's just going to let it go. And uh, so she was a lot of fun. All right. So, so, so channel that voice again now. And in this very difficult time that we're all going through, we have to acknowledge that it's a really difficult time in so many different ways. And, and I know, um, I know that you've gotten involved politically one way or another. So talk about the role of a writer in difficult times, you know, in, in, in Latin America, the you know, writers and politics, you know, go hand in hand in this country, not so much, but so tell me what your view of a writer should be in this, in this age that we're going through right now. Well, I, I think, I actually think that, that it's important for everyone right now to be speaking speaking their truth, speaking their beliefs. Um, as writers, you know, th that's the tool um, that, that I feel I can use to possibly um, reach people. And, and so I, I think it is important that we, that we reach out in whatever way, um, whether, whether it's writing a letter, you know, to someone, you know, trying to understand what's going on, um, or, or op-ed pieces. I mean, I, I think that, um, and I, I'm someone who, who by and large has, you know, I, I like, I, I like for everything to be at peace. You know, I'm sort of that person who wants everybody to be having a good time and let's just all be cool. And, um, and so it's been particularly hard, you know, because um, in, in my situation, I do know a lot of people who don't share my political beliefs and, you know, we've, we've all, um, I mean, that's always been true. It's just never felt the way it feels right now. I mean, we've always said, well, you know, don't talk religion, don't talk politics at the table. 
Um, don't take it to Thanksgiving. Um, but but this is this is all different. This is a, a different arena. And so I think it is important for us um, to let people know um, what what we think and what we believe the same way that if you see, you know, if you see someone being mistreated, um, we're, you know, I like to think we're not going to stand there and watch it happen, you know, that we're going to say something or do something in the moment. And I think this is one of those moments. I think you're absolutely right. And in the meanwhile, you're also you're also giving so many of us the comfort of your words. They, we're able to, you know, we're able to use, we're able to crawl inside your work and escape for a little while and, and into someone else's life uh, that you do so masterfully. Thank and Jill you. McCorkle, I can't thank you enough for it. And I also personally want to thank you for your unending support of independent bookstores and all the work that we do. Huh. Um, not just books and books, but all over, <laughs> all over everywhere. Yeah. You're, you're beloved by all of us. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for, you know, understanding the synergy of the writer and the bookseller and the reader and where we all fit in this crazy world of ours. Well, thank you, Mitchell. I mean, that means, that means the world coming to you because as, as I said, green as grass, that first that first event for me and I met you and I met the wonderful now lost to us, Nancy Olson. And, um, you know, I came away. Well, I mean, it, it set the pace because, uh, I, I was a fan then and I continue to be. And, um, yeah, we here in the pandemic, you order from your Indies, you know, yes, it, please it, do. Very, please do it. Yes. Everybody out there can order a copy of Hieroglyphics. We thank all of you for coming tonight and partaking of this event. And Jill, you know, be safe. You, you know, I, I, I hope all goes well. And, you know, um, I look forward to the next one. Do we know what the next thank one you. is yet? Well, I'm working on stories now and the new idea starting uh, for the novel. So. Good. Yeah, good, I good, good. It, it feels so good to escape in into that. <laughs> so. Well, and then the next time it'll be virtual, and we all we'll all be gathering in the bookshop. So I, I can't, can't wait. wait. Now I really look forward to that. We do too. Thank you, Jill. Thank Have you so much, night. Mitchell. Good night. And I thank all of you out there as well. And, yeah. Um, I think what I'm supposed to say now is make sure that you purchase your copy of Hieroglyphics, you can just click down below and um, we'll make sure you get a signed copy. Again, thank you. Thank you. Good night.